Okay. All right. So, uh, so next, uh, so yes, midterm exam on Wednesday. Uh, tomorrow, um, there's no uh, quiz in discussion section. Okay. So no quiz in discussion section. Um, and I think I talked to your TA, and he's planning on uh, just converting it to office hours. So you know, no attendance or anything. You you show up, you got questions and stuff. Yeah, question. Does the mission cover up to the orientation? It covers up to uh, R6. Okay. Yeah. So um, so no GG plot, and none of today's stuff either. So so up through Wednesday of last week. Okay, and then and then again for regarding R six, there's no uh, private active stuff, private fields and active fields. Okay, just just up to public R six, and technically that's all you need to uh, complete the homework is up to public fields and methods in R six. Um, all right. Um, okay. So now um, now it's sixth week, and we. Uh, the class itself, this course, has a like kind of a definitive shift in tone and focus. Okay, so the first half was all kind of focused on our programming and kind of key features of the uh, the language, and now we're going to start uh, moving into actual computational statistics stuff. So um, we're going to start. You know, we'll, we start off with just some stuff about numbers. We're going to look at like root finding methods, numeric optimization, and then um, basically uh, doing uh, hypothesis testing uh, via randomization tests and not relying on, you know, you guys did hypothesis testing back in like stats 10 or your intro stats class or your AP stats class in high school or something. Um, but that was all based on central limit theorem, right? So, um, so now we'll kind of take a computational approach to that. So, uh, so today's lecture, and, uh, and we'll continue this on Friday, we'll focus on floating point numbers, right? And so, you know, some of you uh, who've taken CS courses, this will be old, old news, um, nothing new here, but, but for a lot of you who um, have not taken CS courses, uh, which I think is most of you, um, floating point numbers and kind of the representations um, you know, there's some some interesting things that happen um, on the computer because of them, right? Where uh, probably all of your math classes have uh, have been in real numbers, maybe complex numbers, okay? And we don't have the computer is not able to represent real numbers, okay? So so uh, so it all comes down to the approximate storage of numbers, okay? So anyway, we start off. We just say, you know, real numbers, how many real numbers are there? There's infinitely many, right? Okay, from minus infinity to plus infinity. So there's infinitely many integers. There's infinitely many countable numbers in the real number line. And there's also infinitely many uncountable numbers, right? So if you pick any two spots on the real number line, like 0 and 1, okay, there's infinitely num many numbers in between 0 and 1, right? And you can pick any two locations on the real number line, and then there's infinitely many of these things. So um, so that's the real number line, right? No, no surprise here. Everybody, everybody's okay with this concept of infinity, that we cannot count to infinity. <laughs> okay. And all right, so now um, these are our properties of real numbers that, I don't know when, they, when you first cover these, like sixth grade, seventh grade, something around there, okay? You learn things like you can add numbers in any order and you get the same number, right? You can multiply numbers in any order and you get the same number. Um, you have things like the distributive property and the associative property and things like this, and, uh, and they all equal each other, right? Um, and then um, in all of our life, we've been using decimal representation of numbers. Um, because we have 10 fingers, and so that is the, that's why we're doing decimal representation, okay? So I think in science fiction, when there's like an alien race that have something other than 10 fingers, they'll have like a different numeric system 
and things like that. But anyway, um, and if you think about like what a number represents, it's it's the sum of you know each number you know raised to this thing, right? So you know we call these. Um, so basically, the number five thousand four hundred thirteen and point two nine or twenty nine one hundredths is five times a thousand plus four times a hundred plus one times ten plus three times one ten to the zero plus two times ten to the negative one so two tenths plus nine hundredths. Okay, this we're all used to, right? Okay, so I'm I'm going through this and then we got scientific notation. Okay, so what what do we have in scientific notation and normalized scientific notation is basically you change everything and you do something with like times 10 to the n power. In um, normalized scientific notation, you can only have one digit in front of the uh, decimal point, and that digit has to be something between 1 and 9. It can't be a 0 in front of the uh, decimal point there. Okay? And, uh, okay. And so this is, like, I don't have to go over this, right? Like, I think you even, like, learn this in, like, chemistry class or something, right? Because it's, like, a big deal in chemistry class. Okay, so um, so you can do this, right? Uh, you got ten to the negative two, and then when you have this times ten to the negative three or ten to the third, it's like this, right? So so these are technically both scientific notation, although this one's the normalized one, right? So we have a number other than zero leading only one number in front of the decimal, and we'd say five point four one three times ten to the third, and this allows us to represent like really small numbers or big numbers. So this is, what is it, Avogadro's number? The number of particles in a mole? I don't know what this is. Some other constant, okay? Um, all right, and then we represent real numbers and we, um, we represent these uh, with infinite decimal representation Things like that, right? So, so certain numbers like square root of 2 or pi or e, they have infinite decimal representations. Even these things, like 1 3rd and 1 7th, 1 9th, they have infinite decimal representations. And we represent them by saying like 0 0.3333333, right? Um, if we try to write this down on paper, we only have an appro approximation, unless we use some kind of... Um, some kind of shorthand, right? So you might write 0 0.3 with a bar over it to represent that the threes go on forever and things like that, right? Okay, and so here is the crux, all right? In a computer, which doesn't have kind of this symbolic representation that we humans are able to do, computers do not have infinite storage and cannot represent numbers with infinite precision, right? So if, like, just to write down the number pi to infinite precision, you would need a computer with infinite memory and infinite hard drive space, right? So even if you have like one terabyte of memory or something, I don't know how many, like probably you'd buy like eight gigabytes of memory and you have a terabyte hard drive, even that is a finite number, right? So you can dedicate your entire hard drive to storing pi, but it's going to run out after, you know, a lot of digits. It's going to stop, right? So we can't just represent numbers off to infinity. So we just say, all right, well, what are we going to do? Let's use um, 8 bytes. That's 64 bits, okay? 64, 0, and 1 positions. How many numbers can I represent? I can represent 2 to the 64, that's quite a bit. 2 to the 64th power, that seems like a lot of numbers. Maybe maybe not fully all of that because of some overhead. But um, that's a lot of numbers, but that's very short of infinity, right? And so um, what we have to do is everything has to be represented with an approximation. All right, okay, so um, we get a hint of this if you use an old school calculator, okay? So in an old school calculator, you have like eight digits, and you can only represent like eight digits with this, okay? So what happens with an old calculator if you do 10 divided by three, what are you gonna get? 3.33333 up to eight digits, and then what if you take that number and you multiply by three? 
Okay, so I videotaped myself doing this exact calculation with an old calculator. And let's uh, allow this video to be opened. All right, so here I am. I type in 10 divided by 3, 3.33333, 3, and if I multiply that by 3, I get 9.999. All right. This is uh So once again, so this is this is what happens, okay? This is the one of the side effects of using um a fixed number of digits, right? So a ca calculator only has eight digits to represent all the numbers, and it's not able to do that, right? Okay, what if we do the other thing? Okay, so we get 9.999. Okay, what if I did 10 times 3, and then I divide by 3? All right, it's, it's stupid, but I'm going to play the video for you, okay? It's going to do exactly what you think it's going to do. All right, here we go. It's taking a while to look. Okay, so here's 10 times 3. That gives us 30 divided by 3, and we get back 10. Okay? All right, and then it's all these suggested videos, which is consists of Star Trek and Disney Frozen. So that's my uh, YouTube playlist history, but that's beside the point. Okay, but anyway, so we get 10. 10 times 3 divided by 3 on the calculator gives us 10. Okay? Um, so this breaks like this vital rule in multiplication, right? That if we do 10 divided by 3 and we multiply it by 3, we get a different number from 10 times 3 divided by 3, okay? So like this would never happen in, with real numbers, but with floating point numbers or finite representation numbers on the calculator, this kind of stuff happens, okay? And it happens all the time, right? Um, so just like another example of this, all right, if I do 2, take the square root of 2, and then I square it, I don't get back 2, all right? So here's 2, and I take the square root, and I get 1.4144, and then if I multiply it by itself, I get 1.98, okay? So just 2 square root is 1.414 multiplied by itself. 1.9999998, okay? So almost two, but not quite, all right? Whereas, <laughs> I recorded myself video doing this, but you know, two squared is four, and if I put square root of four on the calculator, it comes back two, okay? I'm not, I'm not gonna bother wasting six seconds of your time with that video, okay? Um, and so, you know, stuff like that happens. Okay, so look at this. In R, okay, R uses our computer, which is way more powerful than a calculator, all right, and it represents our numbers with 64 bits, not eight digits on a fixed screen, okay? But we still get results like this, right? So if I say 0 0.1, A store 0 0.1 in A, and if I print out A, I get 0 0.1, okay? And then I say do 0 0.3 divided by three. And then, uh, and I store that into B, and I get 0 0.1. And if I ask, is A equal to B? I think you guys have a sense of what's going to come up. What will happen if I say A equal to B? We feel like it should be true, but it comes back false. Okay? And like, I, I can do this like for real if you, if you think I'm like lying to you. Okay? All right, so if I do A is 0 0.1, and I ask what is A, it's that. And, um, and I say B is 0 0.3 divided by 3, and what's B? It looks like that. And I say A is equal to B, and it comes back false. Again, A is that, B is that, but A equal to B is false. If I do A equal to 0 0.1, that comes back true, okay? But B which looks like 0 0.1, and if I say is that equal to 0 
it comes back false. So there's a difference here. All right. Similarly, if I say A is 0.1 plus 0.2, it comes back and says A is 0.3, exactly as I would expect. If I say B is 0.3, it comes back and says it's 0.3. But then if I say is A equal to B, it's going to come back and say false. Okay. Um, here I do a sequence. I say sequence 0 to 1 by 0.1. So I get 0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4. Okay, and I say, what's the fourth number here? Okay, this is 0 0.3, and it's 0 0.3. And I say, is that equal to 0 0.3? And what's our answer? No, it's still no, okay? So, um, and then I, I just have a whole bunch of these things, right? I got 4 fifths times 3 times 5 fourths. This should be 3, right? If you think of the fractions that we're doing. Okay, and then here I do 4 fifths times the quantity, 3 times 5 fourths. And that comes back 3. So I got 3, and I got 3, and I said, is this 3 equal to this 3? And the answer is no. Okay, and um, I don't know. You guys are not impressed. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but this I've, I've seen this question pop up in interview things, right? Where they, they ask, they'll do something very simple like this, where they'll do like uh, 0.1 plus 0.2 is, point, is 0.3, and 0.3 is 0.3, and are they equal to each other? And you got to know that the answer is not <coughs> necessarily true, okay? Um, okay, so what's going on, all right? If we say option digits equals 20 or 17 or something, okay, um, we see 0.1 is represented by this number, 0 0.1000001, okay? 0.2 is represented by this number, okay? And 0.1 plus 0.2, when I take these two numbers and I add them together, okay, I get 0 0.3000 and it ends with a 4, okay? Which seems weird, right? This is a... If I added this, I should end with a, with a 2, but I end up getting something that ends with a 4, okay? And then meanwhile, if I just type in 0 0.3, I get 0 0.299999, okay? All right, and so what's going on is when I do something like this, where I say is 0 0.1 plus 0 0.2, that's 0 0.3, and what is 0.3? It's 0.3. And if I say, are they equal to each other? It comes back false. And the reason for that is 0.1 plus 0.2 is actually this number. And 0.3 is equal to this number. And are these two numbers equal to each other? They are not. Okay. And that's a side effect of using floating point numbers. Okay. So if I asked, uh, is this number equal to... All right, like if I type in 10 into the uh, the calculator, okay, or I do uh, 30 divided by 3 and I get 10, and I say is 10 equal to this number, they're not equal, right? I can actually take a difference between this number and 10, I would get some some value that's not zero, and that's basically what we're have what's we're getting is that these two things are not equal to each other, right? Um, here I've got 3, 0 0.3, 0 0.4 minus 0 0.1, 0 0.5 minus 0 0.2, 0 0.6 minus 0 0.3, and 0 0.7 minus 0 0.4, and they all look like they're 0 0.3, okay? How many of these are distinct values and how many distinct values should there be? There should not be, there should be only one distinct value in terms of the real number line, but in computer representation, there are actually, um, when we print these out, there are actually three different numbers here, okay? We have the 0 0.299999, and then we have the 0 0.300 that ends with a four, and then I have a 0 0.2999 that ends with a three, okay? Sometimes I get back the 0 0.299, and the, you know, like, um, so 0 0.3 and then 0 0.5 minus 0 0.2 end up equal to each other, um, but this one ends up being different. All right, so, um, so what's happening under the hood is that inside your computer, all of the numbers are being represented by, in binary, zeros and ones, okay? And 
it only has a finite number of digits to represent things. So just like that, the old calculator is only able to represent things with eight decimal digits. Here we're able to represent binary numbers with only a certain finite number of digits, right? And so um, I think most of you learned binary somewhere, but then um, in case, like some of you, a handful of you have not, okay? And so the way we represent binary is the first digit represents the ones place, and then uh, the next digit over here, this is, this is a better ex example. The, the first digit, the rightmost digit is the ones place, the next digit is the two to the first, the twos place, then the next is two to the second, the fours place, the next is two to the third, the eights place, okay? And so if you take a number like 11, it's gonna be represented with one, zero, one, one, you have a number, you have an eight, okay? Nothing for the fours place, see, that's plus zero. One for the twos place, so that's a two, and then one for the ones place, and that's a one, and eight plus two plus one adds up to 11, okay? And then so these are all of the numbers uh, zero through 15, which is the numbers you can represent with four bits. Okay, yeah, question? Yeah, okay, so, so if you just think about, um, the decimal number, right? If you write in the number uh, 4321, 4,321, that one is 10 to the zero, the ones place, okay? And then the next digit over the two is 10 to the first power, okay? So 21 is two times 10, 10 to the first power, plus one times 10 to the zero, okay? And then 321 is three times 10 to the second, two times 10 to the one, and one times 10 to the zero, okay? So it's the same idea here, okay? Except it's not 10's power, it's two's power. So we've got two to the zero power, which is one, two to the one power, which is two, two to the two power, which is four, and two to the three power, which is eight, okay? So to represent the number, did decimal number 11, we're gonna represent it with the binary number one, zero, one, one, okay? One, eight, one times two to the third, plus zero times two to the second, plus one times two to the one, and one times two to the zero. So that's eight plus zero plus two plus one, okay? And if I had one, 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 this would be, this would be one times two to the second, or that would be a four here, and this would be 15, okay? And so here's just kind of a table of the first 16 numbers from 0 to 15, and then here's just kind of a broken down example, right? Okay. Um, similarly, we can represent fractional numbers, okay? And then so the place after the decimal, or it, technically it's a binary point, not a decimal point, but a binary point, the first position after the binary point would be the halves place, and then the second position after the binary point would be the quarters place. The third position after that would be the one eighths place. And then you have the one sixteenths place, so on and so forth. Okay, so we would represent one half with binary 0 0.1, one quarter with binary 0 0.01, one eighth with binary 0 0.001. Okay, and three eighths be, being one quarter plus one eighth would be 0 0.011, all right? So the kind of fractional binary values, okay? And so if you wanted to represent the decimal, decimal number 0 0.1, okay, one-tenth, okay, it is not possible to represent that in binary with a finite number of things. Just like you cannot represent one-third with a finite number of decimal fractions, or decimal points, okay? You have to have continuously repeating threes. In the same way, you cannot represent the number one-tenth, okay, with a finite number of binary things, okay? And so in binary, you have this kind of infinite representation of 0 0.00011, and the 0011 keeps repeating off forever. Okay, and so um, because we can only represent a finite number of digits, it gets truncated at a certain point, and you get something that's close to 0.1, but not exactly 0.1, okay? Just like 10 over 3, 3.333 is close 
to the fraction 10 thirds, but not exactly so, okay? And then so you get the, these inequalities here, okay? Um, binary num um, numbers on the computer have been standardized in this IEEE 754 standard, okay? This was, um, this specification was created in 1985 and they had a revision in 2008, but the, uh, which uh, adds, added some stuff, but basically um, we're gonna just cover the 1985 specification, which is enough for our purposes, okay? Um, Institute of Electric and uh, something engineers, okay? <laughs> um, okay. So this is um, how we're going to represent numbers in binary notation, okay? You're going to have um, a bit for the sign, a bit for the mantissa or significant, and uh, or several bits for the mantissa and significant and several bits for the exponent, okay? Um, the... Uh, Oh, and one other thing is that this number specification is implemented at a hardware level. It's not something unique to R or your, your software. It's done at a hardware level. So when the computer tells the number, like when your software tells the number computer chip 0.1, it implements it into binary at, at, at a hardware level. So um, everybody who's using an Intel chip or AMD chip, pretty much all the chips have implemented this specification, right? You'd have to go into like some super ancient computers where maybe the chips were not conform designed according to this specification to get something different. But, uh, but this is kind of just this internationally recognized um, system for how we represent numbers, okay? Um, okay, and so, so this is a little bit weird. But we've got a uh, negative one to the sine bit, okay? And so sine, uh, if the sine bit is zero, it's gonna be a positive, negative one to the zero is positive one. If it's one, it's gonna be a negative number, okay? The leading digit is always a one, okay? Because if you think of uh, standardized scientific notation, the leading digit cannot be a zero, right? And so in regular scientific notation, that number can be anything from one to nine, okay? But in binary, if we say the leading digit cannot be a zero, then the leading digit has to be a one. There, you have no other digits in binary, right? So, so we can always assume that the leading digit's a one, right? And then after everything after that is going to be represented with the mantissa or binary bits, and then we multiply it by some exponent uh, because the base two is going to be two to some power here. All right. So, here is uh, this is not yet floating point. This is just some number six point three seven five. And we would represent this in binary using 110.011, right? So uh, this is a 4. This 1 represents 2. This 0 is 0 in the 1's place. This 0 is 0 halves. This 1 is the quarters, or 1 fourth to 0.25. And then this uh, final 1 here is 1 eighth, or 0.125. And so if I add all of these together, I would get 6.375, okay? And to make this normalized to, into binary scientific, all right, I would take this number 110.011 in binary, and just like in scientific notation, I would just roll that dot to the left two spots, all right? So if I take this and I move it over to the left two spots, this becomes 1.10011 times two to the second power, right? So the, these two numbers are exactly equivalent, right? And so if we look at this, this is becomes the ones place, okay? This is the halves, the quarters, the eighths, the sixteenths, and the thirty seconds, okay? And and if I add all of these up, okay, one plus one half, no quarters, no eighths. 1 16th and 1 32nd, I would get 1.59375, okay? And now this is being raised, uh, multiplied by two to the second power. So I multiply this by four, and I get back the original number, 6.375, okay? So these, these two representations are exactly equal, right? So we're probably accustomed to seeing things like this, but everything in the computer is gonna be done using 
kind of binary scientific notation where we're, we only have one digit in front and it's a one, things that trail it, and it's multiplied by two to some power. Okay? And so this is how we, how we are going to represent numbers inside the computer. And so um, when, we, uh, when we represent numbers in the computer, you can have uh, different levels of precision. Single precision, double precision, or long double, okay? Um, and with double precision, which is what R uses, we use 64 bits. Single precision uses only 32 bits, and then you can have a long double which uses eight, 80 bits, okay? Um, so on double precision, which is uh, pretty much most computer systems, okay, 64-bit computer systems, or even, even not, uh, we have double precision numbers. Um, this is what, when you type in a number into R and it comes back type double, this is what they're typing about, double precision floating point numbers. And we have one bit for the sign, 11 bits for the exponent, 52 bits for the mantissa. Okay, so this is how it allocates the 64 bits. All right, so if we think about the 11 bits for the exponent, we're going to have 2 to the 11, or 2,048 possible values, okay? 2,048 possible values there, all right? Um, the uh, case where you have all zeros and all ones, those are special cases, so that you have 2,046 um, integers to represent positive and negative exponents, okay? And so, um, so we kind of shift that down and we have a, we can represent values from negative 1022 to positive 1023 for the exponent, okay? And, uh, and this is done by using what we call an exponent bias. And I'll explain all of this in a, in a moment here, okay? But, uh, but basically we can represent base, uh, 2048 unique values with these 11 exponent um, bits, okay? And then with the fractional part, the, uh, the mantissa part, we can represent 2 to the 52 unique values, which is, which is quite a bit, okay? Um, when you have all ones in the exponent or all zeros in the exponent, we have uh, these take on special meanings. All ones will be used for infinity or not a number, okay? So then inf value infinity is a type double number, and nan is also a type double uh, thing, okay? And then all zeros uh, will be used for what we call denormalized numbers, and I'll cover that um, a little bit later as well. Okay, so to kind of really get into this, we are going to use um, a mini float representation. So rather than using all 64 bits, we're going to have like a miniature version that kind of follow the same specifications, but using only eight bits, okay? So we're gonna have one bit for the sign, three bits for the exponent, and four bits for the mantissa, okay? All right, so as far as the sign goes, I think this is fairly straightforward, okay? If the number is positive, then the sign bit is going to be zero, and if the number is negative, the sign bit is one, okay? Uh, and so one side effect is that you're gonna have uh, two representations of zero. You're gonna have a positive zero and a negative zero, okay, that are exactly equivalent to each other. Um, okay, and then we've got three bits for the exponent, okay? So with the th three bits, we can represent eight unique values, zero through seven, okay? And in order to represent both negative and positive numbers, we're gonna use an exponent bias, okay? So if I take the numbers, I can go 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, so on and so forth, up to 7. And so these are in decimal values, that's going to be 0 through 7. But I just want, I want to be able to represent negative and positive numbers, so I'm going to shift these numbers down, okay? So um, I, what I do is I just subtract 3 from every value, okay? So the zero gets shifted down to be negative three, the one gets shifted down to be negative two, 
so on and so forth. The 6 gets shifted down to be 3, and the 7 gets shifted down to be 4. Okay? And I guess peop, uh, you know, the engineers who specify this could have chosen to shift it down in any arbitrary number, right? You could have shifted it down 1, 2, 3, 4, you know, up to 7. But they figured we want to kind of center this, okay? So you're going to have half of the numbers, about half the numbers negative and half the numbers positive, okay? And so they could have chosen to shift it down 3 or 4, um, and they chose to shift it down 3, okay? 3 will go from negative 3 to positive 4. If they shifted it down 4, it would have gone from negative 4 to positive 3. And I guess they figured, let's... Let's give the positives the extra number, okay? Um, so that's that's how it is. And so, um, so in general, okay, the exponent, the amount that we shift, the exponent bias is going to be 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. So in our case, we have three bits representing the, uh, the exponent. So we're going to have 2 raised to the 3 minus 1, which is uh, 2 to the 2, 4. Minus 1 is 3, okay? So my bias is 3. When I had 11 bits to represent the exponent, okay, then the exponent bias is 2 raised to the 11 minus 1, so 2 to the 10, that's 1,024, and then minus 1 is 1,023, and so my exponent shift, or exponent bias, is 1,023 in a regular double precision uh, floating point number. Okay, we shift everything down 1,023 numbers. Okay, and then again, all zeros or all ones have special meanings, okay? All right, um, and now uh, the last part is we have four bits for the mantissa, all right? So normalized binary scientific, we can always assume that the leading digit in front of the dot is always a one, okay? Because if it wasn't, it's a zero, and that's not going to be normalized, all right? And there's no other leading digit that it can be. And then those four bits just basically fill in the four dots, or four spots after the, uh, I guess the dot, the binary point here, okay? And so we're going to have uh, one point something 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 times two to whatever the exponent value is, okay? The, um, all right. So, what number, if this, if we have our mini float representation, what number do these following bits represent? Okay, and so this first bit is the sign. These next three bits are the exponent. The exponent is 101, and these last four bits, 0, 1, 1, 1, are the mantissa. Okay, so the sign bit is 0, the exponent is 101, and the mantissa bits are 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay, is that all right? The breaking out from the 8, eight mini float representation, 8 bits, we break out into the sine, exponent, and mantissa bits, okay? So the sine bit 0, so we know this is going to be a positive number, all right? So let's take a look at the exponent bits and the mantissa bits, okay? So the, uh, so this is our number here. The exponent bits are 101, okay? So 101 in binary is going to be 4, 0, 1, 5, okay? So 101 is 5 in binary, or 101 in binary is 5 in decimal, Right. And then the exponent bias is 3, so the exponent value is 5 minus 3, 2. So we have an exponent value of 2. So it's going to be 1 point whatever the mantissa is times 2 to the 2. Okay. The mantissa bits are 0, 1, 1, 1. Okay. So we plug that in, and we're going to have 1 point 0, 1, 1, 1 times 2 to the exponent, which we solved to be 2. Okay, so what is this equal to? So we have a 1, no halves, 1 quarter, plus 1 eighth, plus 1 sixteenth. Okay, so what is, what is that? 1 quarter, plus 1 eighth, plus 1 sixteenth. Seven, seven sixteenths, one and seven sixteenths, okay? So um, so there's a few ways we could do this, right? So I can do this, I got seven sixteenths, one and seven sixteenths times four, or I could distribute the four, so I've got um, uh, this, and I get four plus 
0 halves plus 1 fourth times 4 is 1, plus 1 half plus 1 fourth, and this adds up to be 5.75. All right. Is converting this to this okay? All right. Okay. How would we represent the number 2.25 with the mini float system? Okay. So 2.25 just represented in plain old binary would be 1, 0. This is the 2. And then the 0.25 would be represented with a 0, 1. Is that okay? So I've got 2.25 is 1, 0, 0 0.01. Right? And then to make this, uh, to represent this in our Thing, we would have to make it into normalized binary scientific okay so that involves shifting the dot over one position okay so we're gonna get 1.001 times 2 to the 1 right so these two numbers are equal right all right and then so now that I have this I can attempt to start converting this into our our uh, floating point system okay so I've got 1.001 times 2 to the 1 power. So my sine bit is going to be 0 because it's positive. And then the mantissa, which is the part that comes after the 1 point, okay, is going to be 0, 0, 1. Okay? But I need 4 bits to fill out the mantissa, so it's going to be 0, 0, 1, 0. All right, I've got a trailing 0 here. So th those are my mantissa bits. Okay, what's going to be my exponent? Okay. The exponent value is 1, okay? Zero, zero, 001? It's, uh, yeah, zero, zero, 001. What did I do? I did, but I need a, a bias of 3. Okay, I typed, the, <laughs> I typed this in wrong, okay? So I've got 2 to the 1, okay? Um, my bias is 3. My exponent value, sorry, my exponent value is 1. The bias is 3, so I need to represent 4 in binary. And four in binary would be one zero zero. Okay, so sorry, I have I need to fix this. Okay, so I have the I made a mistake here, but um, so the exponent is two to the one. So the exponent value is one. The bias is three. I need to represent four in binary, which would be one zero zero. So the final number would be zero one zero zero, and I'll, I'll fix that up, and then zero zero one zero. Okay, so sorry, I have a. I have a 5 here. All right. Is that okay? As far as this goes, I apologize for... Let me fix... i got to fix this up. Fix it up before the next class. But you guys get the uh, slight mistake here. Okay. So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll fix that mistake there. Okay. Um, we'll continue this on and talk about the special cases with all zeros and all ones in the exponents because... Uh, and then there's some interesting implications of having a floating point system. All right, so we will see you guys on Wednesday for the uh, midterm exam. We'll continue on floating point numbers on Friday. Uh, good luck as you guys study, and uh, we'll see you then.